Good morning, everybody. Here we are again with another seminar at the Instituto Astrofísica de Andalucía in Granada, in Spain. And today we will have the talk by Sara Casoli. And, uh, and she will talk about the unexplored outflows in nervi, nervi low luminosity AGNs, the case of N NGC uh, 1052. Sara Casoli has a degree from the University di Bologna in Italy and a PhD in astrophysics from the uh, Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. She did uh, her PhD thesis doing a search for neutral gas superwinds in nearby luminous galaxy with the strong star formation at the uh, Centro de Astrobiología in Cesic, Madrid in collaboration with the Galaxy Evolution Group of the University of Cambridge. She is currently a postdoctoral research in the Severo Ochoa project here at the IAEA in Granada. Her line of research is galaxy evolution with a special focus on active galaxies through the analysis of data cubes obtained with the integral field spectroscopy technique. She is co-author of uh, 29, 29 specialized articles in Q1 journals like Astronomy, Astrophysics, and Nature, and uh, with uh, plus uh, over uh, 400 total citations. She has participated in a specific evaluation committee, master and PhD thesis, and is co-supervisor of a PhD thesis. Her teaching activities include courses for the University of Andalusia in Murcia, as well as data management workshops. She is dedicated to science outreach also and promotion of the role of women in science since 2016. So thank you very much, Sara, for uh, this talk and the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Thanks, uh, René, for the presentation. It's a pleasure to share with you our recent uh, work about uh, unexplored outflow and specifically the case of NGC 1052. So perhaps to some of you... Sarah, uh, sorry. you need to share the screen. Oops. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Emotion. Uh, Here we are. OK. Perfect. Can I start? Yep. OK. Uh, hello again. It's a pleasure to share uh, with you our recent uh, results about uh, unexplored outflow and specifically the case of NTC 1052. Perhaps uh, some of you raised uh, some eyebrows reading the word unexplored outflow together in the title of, uh, my, of the talk. Indeed, outflows, at least, the outflow phenomena should ring a bell to many of you, actually a big bell. Indeed, in the latest 20 years, outflows has been widely explored. You can check this uh, by doing a simple search in IDS uh, with outflow in the title, with the referred publication and in the field of galaxy, and we, you will find more than 1,500 papers. And this is a lower limit because sometimes the outflow, outflows are called uh, galactic winds in starburst galaxy. So thanks to this work, we saw many manifestations of uh, the outflow phenomenon in nearby galaxy and active galaxies, such as MH2 and the Circinus galaxies. And outflows are found to be common also in the more distant universe. Here we have the case of the Teacup galaxy. Uh, overall, outflows are a common phenomenon. It is important to keep in mind that also our galaxy hosts a nice uh, outflow called Fermi Erosita bubble. Outflows are made up by a number of phases, X-ray emitting plasma, ionized gas, neutral gas, and molecular gas, for saying uh, some of the phases. And spectroscopically, these uh, phases can be proved thanks to uh, both uh, uh, emission and absorption line. In the optical range, we have access to the warm uh, ionized uh, gas, thanks to Balmer line and other lines, such as oxygen one and sulfur two and also to neutral gas thanks to the sodium absorption doublet. In longer, at longer wavelength, we can probe the molecular gas thanks to the CO uh, line, for example. 
Uh, today, I will focus mostly in uh, how flows in active galaxy. Uh, a quick uh, reminder, galaxy host the supermassive black hole at age centered, but only less than 10% can be called as active. Active galaxy host and active galactic nucleo are the center, and the different elements of this uh, AGN are summarized here. So in the very center, there is, there is a supermassive black hole. It is surrounded by an accretion disk. And then at larger radio, there is a, a region of clouds moving very fast called broadline region. And all these elements are enclosed within the dusty obscuring torus. At even larger distance from the supermassive black hole, there is the narrow line region and also the radio jet. Radio jet may propagate it either on millier second or sec or second scale, being small jets, but also can reach uh, megaparsec scale and um, much farther than the extension of the galaxy. There is uh, different uh, AGM families, mainly um, that can be uh, differentiated between supermassive black hole properties, radio emission, accretion, and uh, orientation. Uh, some of them are quasar, CIFER, BLAZAR, BLAC. And uh, I just want to mention that uh, type 2 AGN are seen uh, through the dusty obscuring torus, while uh, uh, type 1 AGN are, shown, are seen in an intermediate uh, line of sight that is uh, not crossing neither the torus, neither the jet. In this type 1 AGN, we can access at the most innermost region of the AGN close to the supermassive black hole. Outflow uh, have a central role in uh, galaxy evolution through feedback effects. And these feedback uh, effects come in different uh, flavors. These different flavors are summarized here in this picture by Usmer and Harrison 2008. And in particular, act, um, outflows in active galaxy can be radiatively driven, radiatively driven by the AGN or mechanical driven by the jet. And they can provide both uh, either or both positive negative feedback or gas recycling. Uh, I will go briefly. I will mention these three different kinds of feedback. The negative back, negative feedback, basically consisting in the gas removal and heating. And heating. This negative feedback can regulate both nuclear activity, star formation, and AGN activity, as well as the mass grow. In the past, this uh, negative uh, feedback has been widely explored and. Uh, it is often invoked to explain the discrepancy between the galaxy mass function and the mass spectrum from simulation. Uh, the, outflow, uh, the outflow feedback is from supernova driven outflow, outflow is more relevant at low masses, while um, for more uh, massive galaxy, uh, the AGN uh, feedback and AGN outflows are more relevant. The, um, Sorry, but the pointing is not working. No. Que pasa? Ahora. Uh, the other kind of feedback is uh, the positive feedback that has been only recently pro proposed and basically consists in the possibility of, of outflow to undergo a vigorous star formation within the outflow. This uh, kind of feedback has been studied through th uh, thanks to optical diagnostic diagram shown here on the top. Uh, that And this diagram are used to um, discriminate between the different ionization mechanisms, so star formation and uh, AGN, uh, AGN ionization, being both either uh, ciphered light or liner-like. Another uh, way to explore this positive feedback is to compare the trajectory of the gas versus that of the stars. The gas recycling basically is the action of galactic fountains. The gas is ejected from the central region, but the velocity and the energy are not enough to escape the potential well of the host galaxy. So the gas is running back onto the galaxy disk, being a fresh fuel for star formation at later times. 
So summarizing, we saw outflows in different galaxy time and through cosmic time. We now know that this gas in, in the outflow is multiphase with different temperature and density. Uh, we have three different, uh, three main power sources, star formation, AGN, and the radio jet uh, from the AGN. And these outflow are able to provide different kinds of feedback. All this aspect has been studied thanks to data and simulation. Some of these work were, works were devoted to explore, to find the possible scaling relation between the outflows and the OS uh, properties. An example is uh, this plotter from Fiore et al. 2017. And they did a compilation of the known cases of molecular ionoside and X-ray winds and tried to uh, look uh, for some uh, scaling relation between the outflow properties and that of the host. In this plot, the mass outflow rate is uh, plotted against the AGM bolometric luminosity. And on the one end, we can see that the sample of that the uh, range of uh, AGN luminosity is well sampled with uh, from 10 to the 43 to 10 to the 48 air per second. But on the other end, we can see that the low luminosity range is completely unexplored. And this uh, is the reason of uh, we found uh, of the word unexplored to get the outflow in the title of my mm, talk. Uh, our, uh, work, I, our group, Yarata IA8, devoted some effort to study outflows in low luminosity AGN. Some works have been already published and some are ongoing. So uh, among low luminosity, uh, low luminosity AGN, we are mostly interested in low ionization nuclear emission line region also called the liners. These liners as this AGN has low X-ray luminosity and a peculiar optical spectrum. Here, the spectrum of the liner and the C1052 is compared to that of a more luminous AGN, the Cipher Galaxy and the C1358. Um, the peculiarity is that the, the liner uh, optical spectra show a bright low ionization line, such as oxygen one, and faint high ionization line, such as oxygen three. In the past, liners were also at the center of a, a debate. Indeed, their dominant mechanism, uh, me their dominant ionization mechanism was uh, um, debated. Uh, there were three different uh, uh, scenarios, AGN, post-AGB stars, or shocks. All these uh, mechanisms were studied thanks to optical diagnostic diagram. We saw an example also earlier. And for what about our study? We are sure that the dominant ionization mechanism is the AGN as all the targets were selected at X-ray. So uh, why, line, why study outflows in liners among the low luminosity AGN population? They are thought to be the most numerous AGN population in the local universe. So it is important to study the outflow phenomenon in this uh, large AGM population. They are thought to bridge the gap between the normal and active galaxy. And moreover, outflows seem to be common in liners. We recently uh, obtained an atlas of 70 liners. Of, uh, we studied the H-alpha emission thanks to HST archival, da archival data and uh, ALFOSC data from the North Optical Telescope. And following Masegos et al. 2011, we described the H-alpha emission as the sum of an unresolved point source plus an extended emission. This extended emission can be diffuse, resulting in a core morphology, as the case of NGC 2787, or can show spiral arm and star forming ring, resulting in a disky classification, as the case of NGC 3226. These extended emissions show they can show the nice morphology of bubbles and bicons, such as the case of NGC 4438, and this would result in a now flow uh, classification. In this uh, sample of 70 liners, we found an, a, det a detection rate uh, of 70 liners, we found a detection rate of 32. Uh, percent of outflow, and this uh, percentage of the detection rate can rise up to 50% if we include the spectroscopy de detections. 
So we also study outflow uh, using uh, spectroscopy with lead spectroscopy in a smaller sample. In, the, in this case, we're uh, 31 liners, both type one and type two uh, liners. We use the archival data from HST again, and also ground-based uh, ground uh, data from uh, twin at Calarato Observatory and the Palomar uh, survey. So uh, we try to uh, identify outflows uh, as broad and blue shifting component in emission line as done uh, widely in literature, thanks to this diagram, which is the velocity velocity dispersion uh, plot and outflows uh, are were, uh, considered with large velocity dispersion and the blue shifted velocity. The outflow rate for this sample vary from 20% in the case of type two liners uh, to the 40% in type one liners. So outflows are indeed common in AGN liners. These uh, outflows are extended dotted and the different detection rate we saw in this, uh, in, in this work may uh, be uh, affected, for example, by the orientation of the slit. Indeed, uh, if the slit is not placed uh, correctly, we can actually not uh, capture the, uh, the outflow uh, as a broad and blue shifted component. And so uh, we can actually have different detection rate. Moreover, outflows as a standard object, their properties may vary along the bubble. So we can see velocity gradient, gradient difference in velocity dispersion, and also in uh, electron density. So, Lead spectroscopy is an efficient way to have a first uh, guess of the presence of the outflow, but the most efficient way to obtain a description of outflows and uh, their properties is integral field spectroscopy. Indeed, uh, IFS data are cubes with two spatial and one spectral dimension. Basically, for each pixel of your, in your field of view, you have an entire spectrum to explore. Uh, we are mostly interested in studying the optical band as we have access at two uh, gas phases of the outflow. And uh, we, in, uh, we, use, we are interested in using uh, Megara at GTC, uh, Integral Field Unit, and MUSE at BLT. Uh, from this survey, we selected a sample of uh, the best case of outflow and we follow up um, this search with Megara at GTC, and we obtained data for 11 targets, and we are now analyzing all the data. Today, I will uh, present uh, with the case of NGC 1052. We, select, uh, we started our exploration of outflows in liners with this case for two main reasons. On the one end, we were able to obtain both MUSE and Megara data that nicely complement each other in terms of spectral resolution, spatial resolution, and the field of view uh, covered, but also because NGC 1052 has been considered as the prototypical liner. NGC 1052 is a nearby object, only 23 megaparsec away. It is a type one AGN, so 1.9 more exactly. So we have access to the broadline region, to the innermost uh, region uh, of the AGN. This AGN is, host is hosted by an er a early type galaxy, either elliptical or lenticular, depending on the author. But in any case, there uh, is a late type galaxy with uh, a low level of star formation rate. NGC 1052 in, uh, in the center hosts a radio jet. The direction is shown here in pink. And this radio jet is, det is detected on milliard second or second scale and is oriented, uh, not, uh, is not oriented as the photometric axis uh, shown here in green. Here are the optical continuum emission map from both MUSE and Megara data. Uh, actually, for MUSE, we were able to uh, cover nearly all the optical emission thanks to a mosaic. And it has to be said that for this case, uh, there, are, there are four different integral field spectroscopy studies. But these were limited either in spatial resolution, wavelength coverage, or, um, spa, um, or field of view coverage. More specific, specifically, the Peter Tal in 2015 covered the 30, uh, 38 
arc second, time 25 arc second at 1.3 uh, spatial resolution. So uh, this is a field of view covered by Dopita and the resolution is worse than Megara and Muse. Sugai et al. 20, 2005 study only the innermost three arc second time three arc second uh, uh, region of, uh, of this uh, object at very high spatial resolution, but analyzing only the oxygen three line. The works by Dameran 2019 and 2020 analyzed a, a even smaller field of view than Sugai at a resolution comparable with news. So thanks to our data set, we can cover the near all the optical continuum emission of NGC 1052, a uh, high uh, spectral resolution and spatial resolution. Uh, to start, we are mainly interested in study gas emission. To do so, to well characterize the gas properties, we have to take into account possible uh, stellar, strong, possibly strong stellar absorption that uh, affect mostly Balmer lines, such as H alpha and H beta, and the sodium doublet. To do so, we modeled the uh, stellar component in NGC 1052 in both data set on spaxel by spaxel basis. And here you, uh, you can see two examples of the fit. In the top panel, uh, the observed spectrum is in black, the uh, model is in red, in gray, the reason we uh, did not consider to their fit. And below the subtraction. So this one is a purely, purely ISM spectrum we want to study. This uh, stellar component analysis has been done thanks to three different tools, GIST, penalizer pixel fitting method, and Voronoi binning. These, these uh, tools also allow to study the uh, different moments of the line of sight velocity distribution. We, as we were mainly interested in gas, we study only the first two moments of this uh, line of sight velocity distribution, and these are velocity and velocity dispersion. So uh, here are the map, uh, maps of velocity of the velocity field and the velocity dispersion map for Muse and Megara. Uh, for the velocity field, we, we see the typical pattern of a rotating disk, the, the so-called spider pattern. And this disk has a large peak-to-peak -peak velocity of more than uh, of about 170 kilometers per second. The, Velocity dispersion map is centrally picked as expected in a case of rotating disk with large central velocity of about 200 km per second and uh, average uh, velocity dispersion of about 145 uh, km per second. Thanks to this uh, kinematic information, we were able to study the rotational support of this disk by using the uh, dynamical ratio, the V over sigma uh, ratio. This value is found to be 1.2 in the case of NGC 1052, indicating that the disk is dynamically hot, so the random motion component is uh, important in the kinematics and dynamic of this uh, disk. Take into account both kinematics and dynamics and compare this value with literature, literature we consider that the stellar component in NGC 1052 is more similar to that of lenticular galaxy rather than an elliptical galaxy. Then uh, with the pure ISM spectra, we modeled emission lines uh, with up to four kinematic uh, components using Gaussian function. Here, uh, example from both Muse and Megara data. Uh, these uh, components are listed here and can be discriminated using their width. width. So the primary component was the narrowest and uh, then uh, the other component was broader and broader and broader. So of this component, uh, three components were used to model all emission lines, so oxygen one, uh, sulfur two, nitro two, and oxygen three, and Balmer lines. And uh, uh, of these uh, three components, uh, the broadest one with velocity dispersion larger than 300 kilometers per second is partially unresolved. So is extended only in the central, in the central region affected by the point, point spread function, the PSF. Due to this, uh, we didn't do uh, a, uh, extensive analysis of this component. The uh, 
broad, uh, very broad component has been studied, has been uh, found to be necessary only to model the H alpha emission. And is uh, very broad with large full width alpha maximum, more than 2000 kilometers per second. Uh, also, this component was where uh, spatially unresolved, but uh, we, uh, due to this large uh, full width alpha maximum and that is detected only in uh, H alpha, we uh, consider that this uh, component is from the broadline region of the AGN. The other two components, the narrowest and the second one, broader uh, with velocity dispersion generally larger than 150 km per second, are the two components that were found to be spatially resolved. And we focused our analysis on these two components. From our modeling, we uh, generate the velocity, velocity dispersion, and flux map, as well other maps. So, such as line ratio and, ele and electron density map. So we found, and then we compare MUSE and MEGARA data. We found that the results uh, in terms of number of components and the general behaviors, behavior of the maps uh, are in agreement. So we uh, and, uh, are in agreement. So today I will mostly focus on MUSE uh, data as they, we were able to sample the ionized gas up to uh, the largest uh, radio. And today I'm going to show you the maps of the, from the modeling of the oxygen three line. So uh, for uh, who is not familiar with integral field spectroscopy uh, and also who, who, for people that work uh, uh, every day with this kind of data, the uh, maps were a little bit complex and difficult to uh, understand. So what I'm going to do now is to walk you through what you are going to see uh, in the maps with a simple scheme. More specifically, you are going to see Muse map in three different field of view. Uh, the largest one, which is basically the field of view of the mosaic, a reduced field of view, and the smallest field of view that match that of Megara. And these three field of views were selected to enhance, to show better the different uh, features. As reference, on the bottom left, the uh, size of the point space function, the PSF, as well, we mark the direction of the photomatic axis and the radio jet direction. For the narrow component, most part of the emission is detected along the polar direction, which is perpendicular to the photometric axis. Part of this emission show a large velocity dispersion with a peculiar butterfly morphology, mostly along this uh, uh, direction, which is the same as that of the photometric axis. For the second component, uh, is not aligned with uh, neither of two direction, but it is aligned with the radio jets in this, uh, along this direction shown in pink. I'm aware that with this scheme, I did, a, I did a little bit of spoiler what I are going to see, but I hope you appreciate uh, the maps and also this uh, premise, and I hope this scheme helps, uh, scheme helped you uh, to read the map. So here are the maps of velocity, velocity dispersion, and flux for the narrow component, top and middle panel, and for the second component in the lower panel. And here are the different schemes I've shown uh, to you. So let's, uh, uh, let's see uh, what are the different features of these uh, different components. So uh, the narrow component show uh, this extended emission up to 30 arc seconds that are about three kiloparsec in the polar di direction with these uh, nice blue and red uh, sizes. And um, also show this uh, uh, region, uh, central region with large velocity uh, dispersion marked in, with contours here and here uh, that we will call butterfly region or butterfly emission. Along the polar uh, direction, velocity are up to 250 km per second, and the velocity dispersion is low of about 50% km on average. In the butterfly region, the kinematic is a bit more extreme with velocity up to 300 km per second and large velocity dispersion. Two uh, 
isolate this butterfly re uh, region, we consider the limit of 90 kilometers per second. And this limit has been obtained uh, by taking the two sigma uh, above the uh, uh, to sigma above the average of the velocity dispersion in the polar direction where there is no peculiar feature. Uh, then from the uh, line ratio of sulfur to line, we calculate the electronic density, which is lower than 100 centimeters to the minus three. And the uh, BPT uh, line ratio indicate a liner-like ionization mechanism. We will, go, we will see a little bit uh, uh, later, some mm, more information about these uh, BPTs. For the second component, uh, it is extended up to 7.2 arc second of about 800 parsec with this naive bipolar and symmetric uh, morphology. And uh, this uh, emission is oriented similarly to the radio jet. Here, the kinematics is uh, indeed more extreme with uh, velocity up to 500. Five, uh, 650 kilometers per second and large velocity dispersion. Again, we calculate the line ratio. In this case, the gas is more dense with uh, uh, electronic, electronic density uh, larger than 100 uh, centimeters to the minus three. And again, we found that BPT uh, ratio indicates a liner-like uh, ionization mechanism. So here are the uh, BPTs uh, with uh, the different uh, line ratio. And uh, in, uh, these are three sets of BPT. We isolate polar emission, the central butterfly region, and the second component. Uh, as if to analyze these uh, BPTs, uh, as a first step, we consider the dividing line by Kaufman et al. 2003 and Kivli et al. 2006 that are able to well discriminate between uh, ionization from H2 region, so star formation, and AGN being either Seifert or liner-like. We also consider the uh, criterion by Filippenko et Terlevich 1992 uh, that uh, um, for large values of uh, oxygen 1 over H alpha, the uh, object can be classified as oxygen uh, 1 strong, so genuine AGNs. So taking into account uh, all of this uh, dividing line, we found that generally the ionization mechanism is uh, liner-like. So no, there is no contribution of star formation and all the uh, line ratio indicate oxygen one uh, object uh, or point. Uh, we also tested another possible scenario. So the, um, we used the, the prediction for post-AGB stars uh, using the model by Binet et al. 1994, marked in pink, in, as a pink boxes in these uh, diagrams. But these predictions are not able to reproduce the observed line ratio in NGC 1052. So this scenario were, uh, were, was excluded. Also, we considered shocks model of uh, by groups at all 2004, but with uh, different differences between the narrow component and the second component. So uh, the models that best reproduce the observed line ratio in NGC 1052 for the narrow component are shocks plus precursor models. So the gas is uh, ionizing itself with both uh, elements. We considered the uh, model with solar metallicity and the electronic density and the velocity we measure in our uh, data cube. And these are the grid uh, shown here in uh, blue, red, uh, blue and red. And these uh, shocks model are able to reproduce line ratio in at least two of these uh, three BPT diagrams. For the second component, we use the only shocks model, so the gas is collisionally uh, ionized. Again, we consider solar metallicity and the values of electron density and uh, velocity we measured in our map. And again, we can see that uh, nitrogen 2 over H alpha and oxygen 2 over H alpha diagrams are able, uh, the, shocks in, uh, the shocks model in these diagrams are able to produce nearly all the observed line ratio. So taking into account the dividing line and shocks model, we consider that the 
ionized gas probed by the narrow and the second component is ionized by uh, a mixture of AGN and uh, shocks. So uh, what we, uh, with, this, uh, with all these results in hand, we try to make sense of what we are going to doing. So now I'm going to show you our proposed scenario for the gas in NGC 1052, ionized gas in NGC 1052. So as a reminder, we uh, saw for this uh, object a nice stellar rotation with blue and red sides with a kinematic axis well aligned with the major photometric axis. We saw that part of the gas emission is extending in the polar direction and part in the radio jet uh, direction. More specifically, the second we consider that the second component that is probing high density turbulent gas with extreme kinematics being collisionally ionized is probing the outflow in NGC 1052. This uh, outflow is propagating in a cocoon of gas of, with low density and, uh, and low turbulence, which is probed by this nice butterfly uh, region, butterfly emission probed by the primary component. This uh, interaction between the uh, with the gas and the radio jet and the cocoon is triggering the expansion of bubbles uh, extended on a uh, kiloparsec scale with clear uh, blue and red velocity with again low density gas, less turbulent and less turbulent gas. This is a scenario we uh, propose it and then we tested that what is the possible power, what is powering the outflows the outflow in NGC 1052. We consider all the three um, possibility. Star formation in NGC 1052 is too low to power the outflow with energy of uh, 2.2 times 10 to 58 erg. This uh, energy of the outflow has been uh, calculated following uh, Morganti 21, 2021 and Venturi et al 2021. Uh, and um, we consider that Star formation is not is, is uh, excluded. So we, cal we uh, calculated the, uh, we compare this energy of the outflow with uh, the AGN uh, power and also with the uh, energy of the radio jet, which is uh, 1.3 times uh, 10 to the 58 erg, uh, erg. And this has been calculated following uh, Mukherjee 2018. So uh, we consider that the uh, most likely power source of the outflow is the radio jet uh, due to the energy because the jet is uh, able to uh, power this uh, outflow, the orientation, this second component is aligned with the radio jet and also uh, the shocks uh, models um, we used. The, the, uh, without precursor, the gas is collisionally ionized and this could be due to the passage of the jet. However, we, uh, we, don't, we didn't rule out a possible AGN contribution to, this, uh, to the power source, to the energy for launching the outflow, as also the uh, AGN is able, alone is able to uh, power this outflow. Uh, then we uh, estimated the typical parameter of used in literature to estimate the feedback. So the, uh, the, the mass of the outflow, the mass outflow rate and the energy rate and compare uh, this value with uh, the property of the host, finding that even if this, um, finding this outflow is uh, not massive, so uh, the mass of low outflow rate, uh, the mass uh, of the outflow is low, and uh, also the rate of energy and mass are low. So we consider that the uh, feedback on the host by this outflow is weak. As a last step in our analysis, we tried to, uh, we studied the property of the neutral gas, looking for a possible counterpart of the ionized outflow. As a first step, we uh, tried to again exploit MUSE data and we calculate the equivalent width of the sodium absorption doublet. However, we found that this feature in MUSE data is weak with equivalent width of uh, about 1.2, 1.5 on average. So we prefer to use uh, for this kind 
the part of analysis to uh, we prefer to exploit megara data where the uh, sodium doublet was at high, was um, is observed at high signal to noise here the velocity velocity dispersion and flux map from this uh, sodium absorption here an example of the modeling so um with for the neutral gas we found that the gas is optically thick the ratio between the two lines is of about one, so indicating an optically thick gas. In uh, the velocity field of uh, in the velocity field, we can again recognize this uh, nice spider pattern with blue and red size. But in this case, the velocity dispersion is not centrally picked as in the case of uh, as expected for rotating disk. Actually, it picks more or less here at uh, 2.5. Uh, arc second eastward from the nucleus. And this uh, peculiar uh, morphology in velocity dispersion map does not have any counterpart in the flux map. So taking into account all uh, the analysis of the maps, uh, the, uh, taking into account the result from this uh, map, we, can see, we interpreted the neutral, gas, uh, the neutral gas as being uh, mm, originating in an irregular and slow rotating disk with a low peak-to-peak -peak velocity less than, one, than, 70, than 100 km per second. Uh, having say said, we tried to do a tentative auto, auto detection. So we, do, uh, we did similarly to what we did for the butterfly region. So we included the nuclear region we take the average velocity dispersion outside the nucleus and take the two sigma above. This limit uh, with this uh, um, approach, the limit in velocity dispersion is 245 km per second. And the region of, uh, of the map with uh, larger velocity dispersion are marked here in the, with this uh, uh, contour. So it's a very small region with a clumpy morphology with mild kinematics. So it's a tentative detection of the neutral gas, uh, a possible neutral gas outflow in NGC 1052. And with this uh, analysis, with these results, I'm uh, finishing my talk. I uh, resume, I, I summarize here the different uh, takeaway messages about stellar component, the ionized component, the ionized outflow, and the neutral gas kinematic. Uh, the best is yet to come. We are exploring outflow in other low luminosity AGN. And uh, I will be happy to take questions if any. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sara, for this talk. And um, as uh, you say, the talk is open for questions. For the participants in Zoom, please raise your hand. And Sara, you can take over the questions in the room. Questions? So I think in the room, uh, we're OK, right? Now, Martin. OK, we have, we have two options. You can approach with the micro, or you can repeat the question. Okay, sorry for the question if this is very naive. I'm not expert in this field, you know, but how does it compare the scenario that you propose for this object to those that explain the outflow in more powerful AGN? And in particular, I mean, for both the, the different mechanisms that are uh, producing the outflow, but also to me, it's very intriguing, but maybe you can uh, explain it better why the misalignment between the whole kinematics, the whole dynamics of the of the galaxy and the jet. OK, so thanks, Martin, for the questions. And I'm not naive. Um, so uh, we did, uh, we tried to compare um, our results, our scenario with, us, with, with literature. And uh, there are some similarities and some differences. Uh, on the one hand, you cannot really compare outflow in, uh, in a more luminosity AGN because the power source is uh, completely different. And for example, uh, if you have a powerful AGN, you can uh, launch the outflow in different uh, 
from in different direction. Well, if um, a weaker outflow, maybe a weaker AGN, you have a privileged uh, direction looking for the path of last resistance as seen, for example, in Euler's and Starburst. And, and this for the uh, AGN um, powering sources. For the radio jet, we, uh, the radio jet uh, outflow connection has been recently proposed. It's not well explored. Some of the, um, of the work proposed that, that this uh, enhancement in turbulence is aligning the, aligned along the radio jet. Some other um, work proposed that the, this turb enhancement in turbulence is perpendicular to the radio jet. So perhaps this, uh, um, this, uh, uh, there, are, there are two possible scenarios, and it depends mostly on the radio jet and the distribution, perhaps, on the, of the ISM uh, around, surrounding the jet. So this, so, but this is, we are still investigating it. But we uh, look at for some uh, analogies and difference, looking to interpret this cocoon of gas work at the beginning was really intriguing. And the for the misalignment mis mis between the the gas and stars, we actually um, explored two uh, main possibility. One is the emerger. Emerger can actually um, create this misalignment if it is strong, but we didn't see any evidence of merger. So we just, uh, there is other possibility and uh, we try to uh, investigate if these polar emission are not actually um, bubbles, but a rotating disk, but the velocity, this, but the kinematics, the overall kinematic was not uh, comparable with the kinematic disk, with the rotating disk. So we tried to, uh, we did these two approach. And at the end, when we found this second component, we tried to, um, to understand the mechanism and the, of this large uh, turbulence emission, we, uh, th we thought that the most probably uh, relation uh, or, or, or explanation for this bubble in this polar direction was this interaction between the jet and the ISM. This is what the best we can do, be also because in liner like galaxy, they are not, um, there is not much gas. So we actually found a peculiar case. And uh, during the, uh, I mean, I have some, now I have some doubt, it, doubt it, if, if it is truly a better prototypical liner. So, uh, but yes, we started the exploration with this because, because on the, uh, it, it's thought to be the be one of the best cases and we have both data. So we can compare and we could check if the kinematic component truly exists in both data set or depend on spatial resolution, spectral resolution. So we are pretty sure about our results. And, uh, but yes, yeah, there are some intriguing um, questions that can be follow up at other wavelength or just doing other kind of analysis. See, more questions? Here online, we have uh, Montserrat. Go on, please. Hello, Sarah, it's Montserrat Hola, here. hello. <laughs> yeah, I have a question regarding the spectral resolution between, well, first, thanks for the seminar, which I have enjoyed a lot, of course. Uh, my question is whether you find any advantage on using the spectral resolution by Megara, which is significantly higher than Muse, to study this kind of outflow. So do you think it's an advantage? Uh, of course, a higher spectral resolution is an advantage. Um, so we did a nice comparison between two results. Uh, we, actually, we did a parallel line modeling so for example, uh, we tried different uh, models for uh, emission lines because uh, some previous work found that uh, oxygen one line and sulfur two line cannot maybe not be having as a, in the same manner, in the same way uh, between uh, inliners or in outflow. So what we did with Megara, for example, is to study these uh, oxygen one and sulfur two line at higher spec resolution and then apply the results to that of Muse. So we found actually some, um, some uh, advantages. 
Uh, but at the end, we preferred to study these uh, bubbles uh, with muse because we can cover all the extension of the bubble. So we did the first uh, run of modeling with uh, Megara, exploiting all uh, the uh, spectral resolution uh, as best as we can uh, the uh, spectral resolution. And then we applied all these results in MUSE data at uh, higher uh, spatial resolution and uh, a larger field of view. So in this case, uh, we, are, uh, we, we, are, we did a lot of analysis with MUSE, but what we are seeing in, uh, with other galaxies in the sample with Megara data, we saw that actually the nice spectral resolution of Megara that is the lowest available with Megara is, uh, is actually allow us to obtain, uh, to map different components that, for example, with other kind of data, we cannot. So Megara is, uh, is a very nice uh, instrument, but for this case was a little bit uh, limiting the analysis if we would base only to in Megara data. Okay. Thank I hope you. this answers your question. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Monse. Another question for Sara. In the room, do you have more questions? No, we're okay. Okay. So uh, seeing no more questions, we can close this talk. Thank you very much, Sara. Thank you for this uh, talk, for this area. Uh, and sorry for the beginning, that uh, <laughs> technical problem. <laughs> okay, I will close the recording now.